Good morning. Is it loud enough? Just checking. Can you guys hear me in the back? No? That, that was a no. Yes. We got somebody in the middle can hear. Can you hear me in the back back there? Yes, we got some yeses. Okay. Come on in. There's plenty of room up front. <laughs> Harold's out here on an island by himself. There you go. <laughs> you got the, the preacher seat right there, you know. We just got, uh, if you're online yet, we just we have a few more people coming in and setting up chairs. We have if you're trying to squeeze in the back, there's a whole row right in front of Colin. I'm not sure why nobody wants to sit next to Colin today, but uh, I, I may be able to guess. But uh, there's a whole area up here that there's room. All right. Hey, it's great to see everyone today. Josh is going to start us out with... Uh, with a couple of minutes about uh, the coat drive, and then uh, we'll get going from there. All right. Good morning. I just wanted to update you. Uh, if you don't already know, we've got uh, donations that we're taking up for a coat drive. We're going to do a kids' winter coat drive. The actual giveaway for that is going to be on October 3rd, so I want to make sure that you're aware of that. It's going to be uh, from 1 to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So we're going to continue to take up donations until then. I, I want to say thank you to all those who have already been a part of that, contributed to that in some way. Uh, we appreciate that. That's, that's going well. Those coats are $15 a piece. So if you haven't donated, uh, that's how much uh, they are to give. And uh, so far we've collected uh, enough for a little over 100 coats. Uh, so that's, that's going well. Our goal, we would love to get uh, 300 coats to hand out. We did 200 book bags. The coats are a little bit less, so we're hoping to, to get 300 of those to hand out to the kids here in the community. Uh, so that's going to be a, a great opportunity. There's also going to be some opportunities coming up to the coat drive to help out. We're going to need help with some uh, sorting of the coats. Uh, that's going to happen the week before, so if you would like to be a part of that, please let me know, and I can put you on a list so we know how many are coming to help. Uh, also, we'll need some help on the day of for the giveaway uh, to be out here and, and to not only hand out coats, but to be a presence here for the congregation uh, in the community so we can be here. The, the book bag drive went very well with that. We had a lot of people come out and help. We had a lot of people that were here to talk to people in the community and to be able to interact, and that was a wonderful thing to see. So we'd love to have that same thing happen with this coat drive. So if you can help out in any of those ways, please let me know. Thank you. All right, it's great. I tell you, it's great uh, where I sit to hear all that you guys are doing uh, and how generous this group is. It's it's truly awesome. Uh, book bag giveaway, coat giveaway, helping our community. Uh, so much we're doing with with missions overseas and and uh, and locally, and it's just really awesome. And it's I'm I'm just very thankful to be part of a community like here at Snellville. Uh, let me remind you, too, online and, and here of October 17th, the uh, addiction workshop that we'll be having that afternoon. Please, please, please mark on your calendar that day. October the 17th, it will be after worship service. And uh, if you haven't seen the, the brochures and things online, there's more information online. Please, uh, please mark that day. Okay, let's do something real quick. Just Everybody just take a second and, and look up. Yeah, look up. I know, it's not something... We still have some people looking down, right? Just, it's kind of hard to look up in it. Look up, the sun's behind us over here, and what do you see, right? Blue, blue sky. What, what do you not see? Rain, we don't see rain. How about beyond that, right? We, we have sent rockets and, and, and telescopes into the heavens to see the things that we can't see, and we still can't see all of it, right? The expanse of what our God created is truly awesome. Uh, just look around you now, kind of like where we like to look at, at eye level, and what do you see, right? Of course, you see buildings and whatnot, but do you see the trees first? Uh, that little bug that's bugging you right now, 
right now, uh, right? Maybe, maybe the, uh, the, 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 the birds and whatnot. Uh, y'all, it's, it's uh, not only important that we look around like this and that we look to see God, it is imperative that we do that. Uh, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. And I will tell you that not one of these trees, not that little bug that's bugging you right now, none of these things that are in the heavens can we create. We beat our chest, we think we're awesome because we can create that jet that's about to fly over, right? But we can't create the little butterfly. And that's our mighty and awesome God. That's who we should remind ourselves every day of the hope we have. And why are we outside? Perhaps to remind ourselves of the God that we have. And, um, and I'm thankful that we get this opportunity to worship outside. So make that a point. Make it a habit to look around, to look beyond what you normally see and see the God that created everything around you. It's not an accident. It's a creation. Y'all, let's pray together as we begin to worship. Father God, so, so thankful, thankful for today. Thankful for the time we have together to worship you and to lift you up as our mighty an awesome God, the creator of all that we know and all that we see, the creator of science, the creator of the physics that are repeatable, that, that, that give us the awesome things that humanity creates because you created humanity. God, make us your people in, in a way that we connect with you and lift you up and focus on you first. Thank you for our opportunity to reach out to our community and impact in so many ways. Thank you for being just part of a community here at Snellville that, um, that, that reaches out to so many and loves so many. God, help us now as we lift you up and to worship you, to look around and see this world that you created and know that you are the audience of our worship. This we all ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. It is truly a beautiful day. If it is convenient, will you please stand with me? Uh, the song lyrics are printed on the bulletin so you can follow along. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Please be seated. The next song is Blessed Be the Name. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his song for man to die, that he might man redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, where angel hosts adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Redeemer, Savior, friend of man, once ruined by the fall. Thou hast devised salvation's plan, for thou hast died for all. Blessed be the name, 
Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Good morning, church. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning as humbly as we know how thanking you, Lord, for allowing for us to wake up and, and see this beautiful day. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this venue. Thank you for your church. Heavenly Father, thank you for everything that you provided in our lives. The simple reminder we heard this morning, Heavenly Father, about looking up and looking around and just being grateful. Heavenly Father, we should be constantly grateful for the things that you've blessed us with. We thank you, Lord, for the health that we have today. And those, Lord, that may be suffering with afflictions or illnesses, continue to be with them, Lord, as you are the chief doctor. Heavenly Father, you make no mistakes. And the things that happen in our lives, sometimes we may say, well, why is this happening to me? But Heavenly Father, let us continue to look to you in good and times that are not so good. Because, Lord, you will bring us through. You have promised us that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. Heavenly Father, we thank those that are listening that are not here with us today for reasons uh, that are beyond their control. But Heavenly Father, please, what we do here today, we ask, Lord, that you bless us and that we do worship you in honor and glory, and it is pleasing unto you. And Heavenly Father, as we close this worship today, let us, Lord, take what we know out into the world and help those that may be lost that all they need to do is hear the good news of your son, Jesus. Heavenly Father, these and all blessings we ask in thy son's name. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. All right, good morning everyone. Look how many folks showed up to today, how wonderful. And it's a beautiful day. You know what's bad advertising? Trying to sell a coat drive in 90 degree weather. That's what's bad advertising, okay? 
um, I'm thinking, you know, we, we need to give coats. Maybe the next time we do this, actually, when we give those coats away, we're going to have an outdoor service. It's going to be October the 3rd. Lord willing, we'll uh, be outside again. It's going to be another beautiful day. But I am so thankful that you're here. Uh, Margie Hager and the Knights and, and uh, so many others have come uh, that we haven't seen in a while. I just can't tell you how wonderful it is to see you. I know I can't name everyone. But uh, it just, it, it brings so much joy to my heart. I hope you brought your Bible with you. You can turn to Psalm 127. I just want to look at Psalm 127. It's such a beautiful psalm, one of my favorite psalms. It is called the Psalm of the Ascent. In other words, this is a psalm. It was a song that the children of Israel, uh, they would sing together as they ascended the steps into uh, Jerusalem, into the temple. And uh, this is one of many of the songs that they would sing. And I can't wait for us when we get to heaven. I believe this is going to be one of the songs that will be sung. We'll think, oh, that's the tune to that psalm. You know, we know it as a psalm. It's got a tune. And they would sing it. And they uh, would sing it out as they ascended those steps into uh, the temple. Also, you'll notice that Psalm 127 is written by Solomon. And this is very interesting. You know, there are very, many of the psalms are written by David. But this is a psalm that's written by Solomon, and it is a psalm that talks about really what is of value, what is of great value, and what is vain. In other words, what is empty. You'll see the contrast as I read it here in just a few seconds. The lesson is really, I want to center this. It could be uh, several things, but this morning, just for a few minutes, I want to talk about the home. I want to talk about the family. You know, for a long time, the family and the home, not just in the United States, but around the world, has been under attack. Um, our culture does not value the home or the family. They're trying to redefine the home and the family. But I got to tell you all, they need it. Our culture doesn't realize they need the home. They need the family. They need what God put together so long ago. And when you try to redefine it and separate it and criticize it and all the things that come along with it, it destroys a foundation, and God, of course, he's the author of the home. He's the one that came up with this idea, and I just want us to think about the home today in light of that, and when I talk about the home, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have children right now. It may be, you're not even married. This, I think this lesson applies to all of us, young and old, about what it means to have something of great value and what it means to have something that is vain or something that is empty. So let's read it together, okay? This is, this is Psalm 127, all the verses. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. It's in vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. And behold, children are heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. Happy is a man whose quiver is full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies at the gate. Now Solomon probably, uh, well, not probably, he is qualified to speak of these things, I think, for two reasons. One is Solomon was what? He was wise. He was the wisest man in all the world. The, the Bible tells us that Solomon was a very wise person. In fact, in 1 Kings chapter 4, the Bible says that, that Solomon had great insight and understanding. Later on in that same chapter, it says that he was wiser than any other person. So Solomon is uh, wise, and he uh, was qualified to write this by inspiration and to talk about such things. But secondly, I think Solomon is qualified because he struggled relationally. If you know anything about um, Solomon, you know about some of his failures, not just about some of the wonderful things that he built, but he struggled in his relationships with other people. Um, Solomon was a builder. He, build, he built houses. I'll, I'll mention this in just a few minutes, but he built houses in cities, literally uh, about a half a dozen cities um, in the Middle East uh, were built because of Solomon. And every one of those cities had a special gate called Solomon's Solomon's gate. So he accomplished a lot, but he also failed relationally. Does anybody remember how many women Solomon had in his life? A thousand, at least a thousand, 700 wives, 300 concubines. What was the man thinking? Can you just re realize 
how, uh, how this guy, in fact, we, all, we know by what the Bible tells us and by history that one of the things that led Solomon astray was the foreign women that he identified with that uh, got into his head, got into his life, and changed the direction of his life and changed some of his thinking. So Solomon is, I think, qualified for two reasons. One is he is wise, wiser than the other person. And secondly, I think he had learned some things along the way from some of his very own struggles. So I want to give you four things real quick, and um, there are four values, four important uh, concepts. Um, if you've got the outline, you can follow along. They're taken from this psalm, Psalm 127. And whether you're here in person or you're, jo you've joined us online, we're, again, grateful for your presence. And my prayer is that you'll listen to the Word of God as we study it together and want to do what He wants us to do more than anything else in our uh, our life. So first of all, Solomon tells us to reject empty activities, reject those things that are vain, pull away from those things that are vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. That means uh, of no value. It means uh, empty. They labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen awake in vain. They rise up in vain early, the Bible says. They sit late and eat the bread of sorrows so there, there is this contrast between something that is of value and something that is vain. Now, the house still has to be built. The cities are something that are already built that need to be guarded. And that's the idea here in Psalm 127 as he uses these two structures. I think Solomon recognizes a basic need for a lot of us that we have to build something to find some kind of fulfillment. We're always doing something and building something and We've got to show something by the work of our hand or the sweat of our brow or whatever it is that there is this basic kind of fulfillment that all of us get for building something and doing something. And Solomon, if you know the story of Solomon, you know that one of the first things he does when he arrives as, a king, of, uh, as king and he begins to make decisions for the kingdom is he goes on a building spree. In fact, one of the very first things he does is he makes uh, an alignment, an agreement um, uh, with uh, the king of Tyre, uh, whose name is Hiram. Um, we have someone in this congregation named Hiram. We have our own King Hiram. King Hiram, the king of Tyre, um, would deliver to Solomon the uh, cypress or the cedar of Lebanon. And so there was a, a kind of an exchange program that was taking place. I'll give you some valuable oil. I'll give you some valuable uh, grain and in, in, in exchange for these things of value that will come from my kingdom. I, what I need is I need some wood from you. And so he would take stone and he would take these, this wood and he would go on a building spree. He would uh, build, first of all, uh, the temple. You know, Solomon was allowed to build the temple. His, his father was not allowed to build the temple. But what's interesting is it would take Solomon seven and a half years to build the temple, but it would take him another 14 years to build his own house. Think about that for a minute. It took him seven years to build the temple, something that people would come and worship would become the center of all. But it took him twice that long, twice that much care, twice the building material, for his own house. It gives you a little bit of insight into what may have been uh, important and what wasn't important to Solomon. After the building of the temple, there is this dedication, and there's a warning from the Lord, and I want to read it to you. The Lord says to Solomon this, and I quote, If you, Solomon, or any of the kings who succeed you ever turn away from following me, this house, the temple, the house will become a heap of ruins. I don't know if, if it's... Um, uh, you know, just not just because of what the Lord said, but there's an interesting archaeological discovery, and that is in every city, including the temple, in every city that Solomon built is in ruins. They, as they excavated the cities of Hazor and Tadmor and all of these cities that Solomon had a part of building, they were all in ruins. Everything that he built literally became vain or empty, torn down. I just find that interesting. I mentioned that in every city that Solomon built, he said that there needed to be guardmen, guard, uh, guardsmen guarding the city and uh, keeping watch over the city. And so 
in every city, there is what they call Solomon's Gate. Again, I found this interesting, is that when you went in Solomon's Gate, it would, there was a long corridor on each side, and they would have archers set up. So if you made it, you were trying to attack the city, and you made it through the first gate, um, they would shoot arrows at you. There would be another three gates to get through the city. If you got through the next gate, archers would get you. If the next gate, archers would get you. If you got it to the last gate, they would drop uh, boil, boiling hot uh, um, oil on top of you, giving you uh, a warm welcome. You see what I did with that, the hot oil, the warm welcome? Anyway, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the idea, archaeologic, the archaeological discoveries of, of what they did in these cities as they begin to put them together is they realized that Solomon built with a purpose, see, that things were set up for a reason, and yet all that he did lay in rubbles. All that he did was, uh, torn, was torn down. The, there's, the, again, the repetition, threefold repetition, I think it means something. In verse 1, they labor in vain who build it. The watchmen stay awake in vain. Verse 2, it's in vain that you get up early. Now, you remember another book that Solomon wrote, don't you? The book of Ecclesiastes. You ought to go back and see how many times Solomon used the word vain. At a very dark time in Solomon's life, he wrote Ecclesiastes. And he would say, almost everything I do, almost everything I build, almost everything I'm involved in, it just doesn't matter. And folks, I want to tell you, apart from God, that's true. That he needs to be the foundation we build on. He needs to be the one that is at the center of all. Not just our home, but, our, but all that we do, all that we think about, all that we say. And I know that means a lot to you because you've come to worship him today in spirit and in truth. But he's at the center of all of that. And so the first thing we realize is there are just some, some things that we need to put away simply because they are vain. And I wonder if many of us have ever just stopped and slowed down and evaluated what, what we are doing in our life, what we are involved in, how much time we spend on a project or television or whatever it is, just stopped and said, is this empty? Is this vain? Is this really something of value that I need to be spending my time and energy on? Here's the second thing. Number two is avoid unnecessary anxieties. It's in vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late and to eat the bread of sorrows, for it give, he gives, that is, God gives to his beloved even as they sleep. And so there's, in poetic fashion, what, what Solomon is talking about here is kind of an artificial lengthening of our days. We all try to do that. May, let's make the day a little bit longer and then on top of making the day a little bit longer, you're going to put anxiety on that. You're going to add to it uh, anxiety or worry. This is what the Living Bible says in translating that. It's senseless for you to work so hard from early morning till late at night, fearing that you will starve to death. And some of you have discovered that anxiety, worry, is a tireless tyrant. Back in 1851, in London, England, at Hyde Park, there was a, um, a, uh, an exhibition. They called it Crystal Palace Exhibition. And it, they were going to talk about the latest inventions. And so you've got to remember, this is 1851. The latest invention wasn't an iPhone. The latest invention had to do with steam. And so what they rolled out in Hyde Park in London there was all of these things that they had invented because uh, of uh, this steam and the use of steam. There were steam plows and steam locomotives and steam looms and steam organs. They even had a steam cannon that shot actual cannonballs, and it was, pretty, it was pretty powerful. But what everybody got excited about at Hyde Park back in 1851 was a machine that had 7,000 moving parts. And when they switched it on, powered by steam, of course, it began to move. All kinds of things began to happen, pulleys and whistles, and, and it, this machine just was incredible. People stood around it in awe. And finally, somebody said, hey, what does it do? And the maker said, well, it really doesn't do anything. It just makes a lot of noise, and it, it, it's pretty impressive. 7,000 moving parts, and it was impressive. That's, that's what worry and anxiety is like. It's like all of these moving parts, and yet it really not doing or accomplishing anything. 
And so Solomon wants to point just a couple of things here, talking about anxiety and worry, is first of all, it's not productive. It's kind of like that machine that has 7,000 moving parts and it's doing a lot. It's just not very productive. It's vain. It's empty to rise up early and to work late. I found a little study uh, University of Wisconsin did not long ago, and it was about worry. And what they said is that they found that 40% of the things that most people worry about will never happen. All right, that's 40% of the things that people worry about will never happen. 30% of the things that people worry about are things regarding the past. So you can't do anything about it anyway. So you're already up to 70%. 12% were worries about criticisms from other people that you couldn't stop anyway, other people criticizing you or saying things behind your back or, or making things up about you. It's, it's really nothing you could do. 10% of the things that we worry about, maybe the health issues, you know, actually uh, go unchecked that, you know, won't improve. Um, they actually get worse. Uh, what they discovered, I guess, at the bottom line was about 8% of the things that we worry about had le were legitimate. 8% were legitimate maybe concerns that may or may not, but they may actually occur, and yet people spend so much time worrying and they're anxious. So Solomon says it's, it's not productive. Secondly, it's, it's not healthy. We know that, y'all. Anxiety and worry, whether it comes from our home, you know, work, uh, our world has caused us to be anxious and we need to trust, and we need to trust the right source, the maker of all things. We need to trust God, and, um, and it's just unhealthy. Scientists, doctors have told us for years it is unhealthy, but I think more importantly, it's unbecoming of a child of God. What Solomon says in here is whether it's our home and the building of a physical home or the building of a family and the building of our relationships, what's really important here is that we trust God. And so it's unbecoming of a child of God to worry about things that we shouldn't worry about anyway because he's going to take care of us. He knows what's best for us. Here's the third thing. We need to cultivate relational priorities. In other words, we need to concentrate on our relationships. Is not all of life relationships? I mean, with every funeral I do, with every wedding I do, with everything that I'm involved in, you know, uh, and I've told this story before, but a couple of years ago, I preached a funeral over at one of the big churches on Main Street, and um, it was a, a, a very wealthy man who had, uh, who had died. He had young kids and a, a beautiful wife. He lived in a beautiful neighborhood. He had made a lot of, a lot of money in his life, but he had a one-of-a-kind sports car, and they parked it in front of the church, and you had to pass by this car as you went in the church building. So that's what they put out front to go into his funeral. And so as I got to know the family, I thought, man, it might be fun to drive this car. Yeah, guess what? I wasn't going to be able to touch the car. I wasn't going to get near it. But when I met with his wife and his kids, they didn't talk about that car at all. They talked about going to the beach. They talked about picnics. They talked about laughter. They talked about things they did at Christmas. They talked about the relationships that they had as a family. They didn't talk about things at all. And I think Psalm 127 reminds us that this needs to be a priority in our life. And it's in it, two ways. One is our relationships with other people and also our relationships with the Lord. Now, in verse 3, he's talking about our children being a heritage from the Lord. They're the fruit of the womb, not fruit of the loom, but they're the fruit of the womb is a reward. At first, he's been talking about building a place and now he's talking about shaping a home he's talking about relationships and I don't know if you've ever noticed about this but the the three uh, people that really are the three individuals that he's talking about in the psalm is first of all the Lord he's either mentioned or implied six times the Lord the Lord the Lord secondly is the fruit of the womb who is that who's who has the womb who has a womb yeah stop pointing at my belly who has that? He's talking about moms, isn't he? He's talking about our mothers, the fruit of the womb. And then the fruit of the womb is the children. They're arrows in the hands of a warrior. So he's talking about relationships. He's talking about family as he moves through this text. God never made us. He never created us to be uh, in, independent. 
you know, an island to ourselves. We are interdependent. We need each other. In fact, one of the first things that God says that wasn't good is when he saw that, that Adam was alone and he had to make Eve for him. He said, listen, this isn't good that he's alone. He made Adam and he did something wonderful that he made Eve for Adam so they could be together and he would need a helper. And so there is this relationship. And even in that, I don't want to go back to that, but even in that it's implied as God meets with them in the garden and he speaks with them and has conversations with them, there is this incredible, wonderful relationship that is taking place between a husband and a wife and God. And y'all, let's not lose that in our, in our relationships, in our life, is to always have him first in your life. If he's first in your life, and it, the husband and wife, then he's going to be first uh, in your home. And then that'll be important to your dad, uh, to uh, your children, not only to a mom and dad. So about this time last year, I went into the hospital, and you know I was in the hospital for about 15 days, and one of the things that I realized is with every meal that was brought to my room, and when you have COVID and you're pretty sick with pneumonia and you're on a mask and they don't want to come into your room, what they would do is they would try to do as much as they could at one time, and I didn't blame them for this, but they'd come into your hospital room and they try to do as much to you at one time, poke you in the, give, you, give me a shot in the stomach, poke me in the finger, check my blood, check my temperature. They would do all this stuff and they would bring my food to me, and sometimes I could see it. It was sitting out in the hall, and uh, I was so hungry. And you see, I haven't missed many meals since then, but I was so hungry, and I thought, man, I couldn't wait for that plate to get in here. And uh, nurses, and they, they were so kind. They were so good to me, y'all. And they would come in. They'd bring me all this stuff. Hey, sorry it took us a while. We just, you know, had to, had to gear up, you know, come in. they do all that they need to do, and they'd leave. But y'all, in the quietness of that hospital room, I'd bow my head. i put my hands on that plate of food, and I'd say, Lord, thank you for this hospital food. Thank you for this little bit of food that I'm about ready to eat. Almost a year later, Kay and I were starting to do something the other day. We are going to eat something, and we are going to watch. Actually, we are watching the, um, the television sh show, The Chosen. And um, we were eating together. And I thought, you know, here it is. You know, we, we pray together and so forth. But that same appreciation that I had, bowing my head, thanking God for that meal and for what I was going through, almost not even a year later, is starting to wane. And for all of us, that happens. We stop and, uh, and, and don't appreciate. With every day we get up and we have the ability to move around, have the ability to communicate, have the ability to love each other and to tell each other how much we appreciate each other. So a guy named Mark Stennett, he's a professor from the University of Nebraska, and uh, many years, uh, not about six years ago, he did a study of relationships in uh, any, not only in the United States, but in uh, five other countries. And uh, this is what he said out of 3,000 families that he studied, um, he wanted to analyze them and he, he, this is what he said, these are the qualities of a strong family, okay? Number one, a strong family is committed to the family. They're committed to the family. Number two, strong families spend time together. That makes sense, doesn't it? Number three, strong families have good family communication. Have you ever seen families go into a restaurant, mom, dad, and the children, all of them have a device in their hand, a phone in their hand, and they're all texting somebody else or reading something else other than having a conversation with the very people around the table. Trust me when I tell you this, there's going to come a time you're not going to be able to talk to them. So put your phone down. Look in people's eyes. Talk to people by looking at them in the eyes. I think it'll, it'll, uh, it'll, it'll enhance your communication. And number four, strong families express appreciation to each other about each other. And I love that. I think you and I need to do that more because I do love you. And I know that you, some of you, love me. And I know, and I do know that you love each other. But I think sometimes we, we leave this place and we fail to say, hey, I love you. I appreciate you. And we might not have opportunities to say that one day. Express your love and appreciation for your kids. My kids are 35 and 33 now, have kids of their own. And I'm always telling them, man, I'm proud of you. I love you. And I can't tell you how uh, I look forward to being together with you. So number five is they have a spiritual commitment. They have a spiritual commitment. And then number six, they are able to solve problems in a crisis. 
So here's a guy, a professor from the University of Nebraska. He evaluates 3,000 families in six different countries, and at the heart of what he said is there needs to be a spiritual commitment involved in your family. So we pray together. We read the Bible together. We, like you're doing today, we worship together. Hey, listen, y'all, it's hard. I know that. It's hard sometimes to get your kids up and bring them. It's hard to, to wrestle with them sometime in the, in, the, uh, in the auditorium and even outside like this. I, Kay and I realize that. We had young ones of our own. We haven't forgotten that. Kay had a, 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 you know, kind of a rough thing because I would go up and preach and leave her alone with two little kids. So if one of them got sick on her or, or spilt you know, uh, something on her or, you know, or just were obstinate and needed to be taken outside, I would watch as I preach. I would watch Kay leave. And you, know, you could see the panic on the little eyes of the people that were going outside. And, um, and sometimes they would come back in and that panic was gone. It re replaced with a red face. We, we, we get that, y'all. We honestly do. And I love you for it. But we've got to stay at it. Don't give up on praying with your kids. Don't give up on reading the word of God to them. Don't give up on bringing them to worship. It is at the heart of all that we are about. And then the last thing is we're going to shape future destinies. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are children of one's youth. And you can almost picture a warrior reaching behind him, taking an arrow out of his quiver and putting it in a bow and firing it. That takes some aim. It takes some concentration. You're talking about shaping someone's life. You're talking about sending them out into a, uh, into a, a very difficult world right now, and you want to shape them. Happy is a man whose quiver is full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak of their enemies at the gate. Children are a heritage of the Lord. They are our future generation. One translation says this, children are God's best gift. And I know depending on what stage your children are right now, you're questioning that, okay? But trust me, they are God's best gift. And I can also tell you they are on loan. They're on loan from God. And they are the only possessions that might come through our life that we can actually take to heaven with us. Children are a precious, precious gift. And they are God's best gift. And that is the home. The home is where life makes up its mind. It's where convictions are hammered out. The greatest influence, for good or bad, it happens, for the most part, at the home. Did you know that 16% of a child's time is spent at school? 16% of a child's time is spent at school. 1% at best is spent at a Bible school or a Sunday school. 83% of a child's time is spent at home. No wonder in the book of Samuel, Samuel would be born, the Bible would tell us, and his mom Hannah, remember in her prayer of dedication, would say, I have lent this child to the Lord for as long as he lived. You know what Hannah did? God gave her a child on loan, and he said, I'm giving this child, she said, I'm giving this child back to the Lord. Spend your time, spend your energy giving to the right things, building the right kind of projects. You know, I, I sum it up by, by saying this. If you're trying to build apart from God, it's vain. Uh, it's, it's vanity. If you're adding worry on top of energy, it's insanity. But if you're building upwards toward God and you're building outwards toward other people, it is a, it is a valuable commodity. At the end of the day, it's relationships that matter, the relationships that we have with one another and the relationship we have with our Lord. We'll sing, give me thy heart. It's on your uh, sheet, your bulletin that uh, we've all been given today. And as we sing that, like we do even inside, if there's something you can get up and come forward and as awkward as it may seem, if there's something we can pray about, if there's a desire maybe you have today to become a child of God, to be born into the family of God, we've got water inside in the baptistry. We can go inside and, and have a baptism if that needs to be done today. But, uh, but maybe today as we stand and sing this song, I'd like for you to rededicate your life to your home. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how long, how far your kids live away from you. I would like you to rededicate your life to being a godly dad, a godly grandfather, a godly mother, a godly grandmother, a godly child, 
a godly aunt or uncle, I'd like you to just rededicate your life. Just tell the Lord, I, I, I want to be more. I want to be, I, I want my life just, I want it to matter. I don't want to just make a living. I want to make a difference. And the only way you can do that is to do that spiritually, to make an impact on the life of someone else. Let's stand and sing, Give Me Thy Heart. Give me thy heart, says the Father above. No gift so precious to him as our love. Softly he whispers wherever thou art. Gratefully trust me and give me thy heart. Give me thy heart, give me thy heart. Hear the soft whisper wherever thou art. From this dark world he will draw thee apart, speaking so tenderly. Give me thy heart. Give me thy heart, says the Savior of men, calling in mercy again and again. Turn now from sin and from evil depart. Have I not died for thee? Give me thy heart. Give me thy heart. Give me thy heart. Hear the soft whisper wherever thou art. From this dark world he will draw thee apart, speaking so tenderly, give me thy heart. Give me thy heart, says the Spirit divine, all that thou hast to my keeping resign. Grace more abounding is mine to impart. Make full surrender and give me thy heart. Give me thy heart. Give me thy heart, hear the soft whisper wherever thou art. From this dark world he will draw thee apart, speaking so tenderly. Give me thy heart. Please be seated. Gail wanted us to pray for uh, Gail and Al's brother-in-law, Jimmy Harmon. They mentioned, uh, we mentioned him last week in our worship service. He had been sick and, and uh, had uh, some issues where they amputated his toe and they were trying to stop uh, uh, any more from happening and and he's now in a coma they're going to do a spinal tap tomorrow and um just wanted uh us to to pray for jimmy father we we uh, know you're listening to us you're part of our worship at the, right here at the center of all of it and we lift jimmy to you and uh we ask that you strengthen him and bless him and and if it be your will lord just help him be able to overcome all that's happened to him and and uh, with his and, uh, and also be with his family and strengthen, strengthen them. We want to thank you uh, for answered prayer. Jay Evans being here today and others uh, um, 
who have had uh, knee surgeries and back surgeries like Perry and others that are just with us in worship today. And, oh, Lord, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for how you have helped. Doctors and uh, wonderful doctors and nurses have helped us to get better, but also your, your healing hand has been in our life, and we appreciate that so much. And, uh, Lord, we, we just want to thank you for um, blessing us uh, with family. And with family comes opportunities to be a light and salt to those around us, even today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, we will sing oft we come together. Oft we come together, oft we sing and pray. Here we bring our offering on this holy day. Help us, Lord, thy love to see. May we all in truth and spirit worship thee. May we keep in memory all that thou hast said. May we truly worship as we eat the bread. Help us, Lord, thy love to see. May we all in truth and spirit worship thee. May we all in spirit, all in one accord, take this cup of blessing given by the Lord. Help us, Lord, thy love to see. May we all in truth and spirit worship thee. When God rescued the Israelites from Egyptian bondage, the final plague God brought on the Egyptians was that of the death of their firstborn. God gave Israel specific instructions as to how they were to prepare for this final event. They were to select a one-year-old male lamb or a goat. It must be an animal without defect. In other words, perfect. Select it on the 10th day of the month and care for it until the 14th day of the month. Then slaughter the lamb at twilight and roast it and eat it along with unleavened bread. They were instructed to paint the sides and tops of the doorposts of their houses with the blood of the lamb. They were to eat it in haste with their cloak tucked in, sandals on their feet and a staff in hand because it is the Lord's Passover. Exodus 12, 12 beginning tells us the Lord said, on that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. On the night Christ was betrayed, he instituted a new remembrance, the Lord's Supper. It is our lasting ordinance. We do this each first day of the week 
in remembrance of his death, burial, and resurrection, his victory over death. He is our high priest, our perfect lamb, who is our mediator before God on our behalf and the lamb of God who takes away the sins of all the world. He shed his blood once for all. Hebrews 7.27, unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Hebrews 9.26, but he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And speaking of Christ, Paul says in Hebrews 5.9, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. It is because of this we partake of this loaf and this cup to remember Christ Jesus, our Savior. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, that you sent him willingly to sacrifice himself on the cross that we might have hope of eternal life through our obedience to him. And Father, as we now partake of this bread, Help us to remember the body that hung on the cross that he willingly gave for us. We do this in remembrance of him. Bless this bread and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us give thanks for the cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that blood that Christ shed. The blood that you see it in us because we have accepted Christ. It's the blood that was on the doorposts of the houses of the children of Israel. And it saved them and it now saves us through our obedience to Christ. We thank you for that blood that washes away our sin. Bless this cup and bless us as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. We ha now have an opportunity to give back to the Lord. We are commanded to give, but how much we give is not commanded. We are encouraged to give generously, Romans 12, 8. We're encouraged to give from the heart. We're encouraged to give to help those in need. We're encouraged to further to give to further the spreading of the gospel, Philippians 4.15. And we're in our giving, it should not be done to gain the approval of others, but in secret. Matthew 6.4 says, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. 2 Corinthians 9.7, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God lives, loves a cheerful giver. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings, all the blessings that you give us. We know that everything comes from you, everything we have. You've given us ability to work and to, to make money, and now it is time for us to give a portion of that back to you. And Father, help us to always understand that we're not giving our money to you, but we're giving the money you have trusted to us back to you. Thank you for all the blessings of this life. In Jesus' name, amen.
we have been blessed with a beautiful morning, and it is great to see so many of you here today. If it is convenient, will you stand with me for the closing song? He took my burdens all away, up to a brighter day, he gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing, in my heart joy bells ring, he gave me a song, a wonderful song, he gave me a song, he gave me a song, to sing about, he lifted me. From singing that all oh, praise his name, he is my king, a wonderful song, he is to me. Brighter the way grows every day, walking the heavenly way, he gave me a song, a wonderful song. A wonderful song I now can sing, praises to him, my king. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song, he gave me a song. To sing about, he lifted me from singing that, oh, praise his name. He is my king, a wonderful song, he is to me. I am redeemed no more to die, never to say goodbye. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. And some of these days in that fair land, sing with the chorus grand. He gave me a song. A wonderful song, he gave me a song, he gave me a song, to sing about, he lifted me, from singing that, oh praise his name, he is my king, a wonderful song, he is to me. Pray with me, please. Once more, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day and the opportunity to come and, and to worship you. And we know it was a choice by your on your account that you're here. And, and likewise, a choice of us to worship with you and for you and sing our praises and, and, and admire the, the blessings you've provided for us. Um, and we know that from the very beginning, that's how you wished as you walked with Eve and Adam in the garden. And then we sinned and then we had to be uh, put out. But you put a plan that one day we can be with you again. And that's what we're internally grateful for. And we pray that that we will regard in your commands and honor them follow them and also follow your your wishes your commands on how we can get back with you and spend that eternity with you in heaven with this we're also thankful for answered prayers of people that have been sick and you've guided the doctor's hand as has been mentioned we're, we're also thankful for that we pray that we will improve our relationships with you and our families and go out for this week make improvements. And this we pray in the Savior's name. Amen. Please be seated.